Revelation chapter 21. Last week we covered verses 6 through 8. And uh, I want you to notice here in verse 6, Revelation 21, verse 6, the Bible says, And he said unto me, It is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And so we discussed somewhat at length uh, about uh, the water water of life, and uh, this offer is, is given here by the Lord Jesus. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the ending, and uh, he is uh, co-equal God, co-eternal God, and a uh, biblical uh, doctrine of the Lord Jesus that uh, God is uh, one Lord, of course, but he is three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and uh, the triune God who say uh, the trinity and uh, so uh, biblical truth there that uh, you have to get into your heart and have a uh, bible basis for that and, uh, and believe and stand on that and the bible says that uh, in verse 7 he that overcometh shall inherit all things and so the, the overcomers or those who overcome are the ones that uh, have faith saved by grace through faith who is it that overcomes uh, even those who have exercised faith in the Lord Jesus they are the heaven bound crowd and so you are overcoming now uh, you, you overcame when you got saved when you got born again and, uh, it, it is both event driven and then uh, manifested in the life that you live. There, there is fruit. And so there, there is dual truth. James spoke about uh, uh, this dual truth. Faith without works is dead. And so just as an individual that has life, there is breath, then an individual that says that they have faith or place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ there is some type of fruit that is manifested therein. And if you go out and, and speak to people, witness to people, do any kind of uh, soul winning, door knocking, you're going to run into uh, all types of people with all uh, types of beliefs. And um, so getting it settled, salvation is certainly by grace through faith. And we speak about the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. Of course, God is sovereign. He's all-powerful. He's the creator God. And, uh, by him were all things made that were made, and without him was not anything made that was made. He's in the beginning. The children say, where did God come from? He always was, and he always will be. And I explain uh, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Explain the fact that you are uh, tripartite. You are body, soul, and spirit. And uh, you, you explain these things. They, uh, some of the things are, are too vast for you and I to understand. We believe it by faith. And uh, <coughs> an individual that believes in evolution believes that by faith That's as true. well. And so you choose which one that you believe. And uh, there is evidence from the Word of God that uh, we say it's proven both historically and um, spiritually that uh, you can believe it, you can count on it. But um, anyway, the uh, ones that overcome are those that have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. However, on the same note, those that have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, there is some evidence of that. There is some fruit. You say, how much fruit and how much works? Well, I, I don't know. That, that's between uh, you and God. But there is evidence. By their fruit you shall know them. Now, here is one of the uh, greatest indications. If, if there is uh, some desire, if, if there's desire, if there's absolutely no desire, then that, that's a flag. If, if 
there's no desire. The Bible speaks about a babe in Christ desires the sincere milk of the word that they may grow by. And then it speaks about uh, that uh, after you get off the milk, there is uh, the meat of the word of God. If there's no desire for spiritual things, it's a flag. If there's no desire for biblical truth, there's a flag. If there's no desire for church, and then there's another category that goes down below that. It's an individual who is saved, but then becomes backslidden. And a person cannot be backslidden unless they were saved. And so backslidden, and the Bible uses the term backslidden, that they have gone backwards on God instead of forward. Well, in backsliding away from God, there is an indication that there is a loss of joy and a loss of peace. So if an individual is out of the will of God, out of the house of God, out of the word of God, and there seems to be no loss of joy, that's a dangerous flag. Here's another one from the word of God, and it's Hebrews chapter 12. And it deals with uh, the doctrine of chastening. For a child of God to be out of the word, will, and way of God, then there is the chastening hand of God. When an individual gets saved, their sins are paid for. Past, present, future sins, they, they've been paid for at the cross. And praise God for that. What that means is that there is never a, a penalty for your sin nature that did not get dealt with. You were born with a sin nature. The sin nature has to be dealt with. How does the sin nature get dealt with? By faith in Christ. That's overcoming and so you will never stand in judgment at the great white throne judgment. You'll never be condemned to, uh, to hell because your sins got paid for. You were eternally saved and, uh, when, when Jesus saved you. But when Jesus saved you and you become a child of God, then you enter into the family of God. You're in a different family. You don't belong to the devil anymore. You belong to the Lord Jesus and there's certain things that the Lord Jesus will not allow his children to do. That's where child training or chastening comes in. It's Hebrews chapter 12. And so the Bible says that every son of God, every child of God, receives this child training or chastening. And that it goes on to say with very strong language that if you are not a partaker of that chastening, that you're not one of his. And so... These are indications for an individual to say, I, I have placed my faith in Christ, I'm an overcomer, and by the grace of God, I'm going to heaven, and praise God for that. The Bible says in verse seven, those that overcome by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they shall inherit all things. Or it means that you're an heir with God, joint heirs with Christ, and praise God for that. But it does lend itself to an examination. Whenever we go to uh, the, the Lord's Supper, when we uh, participate in communion, Lord's Supper, Lord's Table, uh, the Bible admonishes us that every man would examine himself. And an examining of himself in that particular case is that I would uh, allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to my heart and see if there is something unpleasing to the Lord, some sin that's not confessed in my life that I confess it and forsake it, so that I don't take of the, the Lord's Supper unworthily and, and suffer and bring on damnation or judgment upon myself. Well, it also speaks of the fact that uh, the Bible uses the term elect often in the Word of God in the New Testament. And uh, that uh, you and I would uh, examine ourselves to see if, that we are in the faith. That uh, we are saved because the Bible says that uh, the devil's... Uh, they believe and they tremble, but there is no salvation for them. And so I, I would say what I'm, I'm saying on this verse, he that overcometh, verse 7. Well, what is the overcomer? The one who's placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not trying to use scripture to get you to doubt your salvation. We use scripture to get you to be assured of your salvation. However, uh, the Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. 
And so, yes, there was an event of being born again, John 3, 3, and 7. You must be born again. But within that event of being born again, you were taken out of darkness into light, set aside. You are now in the family of God. And within the family of God, there's some indications that you are a family member of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a desire. You know, all things become new. And so you examine yourself to see if you are of the faith. And then if, if there's doubt, man, you get it right. You get it right now before it's everlasting too late. Many shall come in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we do many wonderful things? And he says, depart from me. I, I never knew you in that sense of, of salvation. In verse 7, he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son overcoming by faith and so praise God for that but in verse 8 there are those who are overcome the overcomers are in verse 7 those who have been overcome are in verse 8 what were they overcome by the ones that are overcome in verse 8 are not going to heaven have no chance of heaven there's no second chance of heaven there's no soul sleep and there's no purgatory that's not taught in the Bible anywhere, even close in the Bible. Verse 8 says, but the fearful and unbelieving. You notice that? Just unbelief. So unbelief, unbelief. I, go, I would go to hell for unbelief. Yes, yes. If I choose not to believe, what do I choose not to believe? In the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation by grace through faith. I mean, you don't have to have a theological degree or read the whole Bible. You have to understand that you're a sinner, that you were born a sinner, and uh, that when you reach the age of accountability, uh, you sin willfully and willingly against God that you're a sinner. You have a sin nature that has to be dealt with. And then I recognize that Jesus died on the cross to pay my sin debt, and I can't do anything of, it, of my own. That there's religious systems out there throughout the world that uh, are leading people astray, thinking that there's some types of a work-based system, even about being good or being a good neighbor, and praise God for that, but none of that will get you into heaven. And then I believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay my sin debt. They buried him, and he rose again the third day according to the scripture. And so by childlike faith, I ask Jesus to come into my heart and save me from my sins. But the Bible says those who are overcome are fearful. And it could be fearful of the fact that when the word of God is preached, they are fearful of things like the devil. But the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It could be that they are fearful of what they'll have to give up. And it's uh, the darkness of sin. This is condemnation. That light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. So they're condemned already, John 3, 18. It could be fearful of what they think they might have to do. And, and people by nature are fearful of what they think they might have to do. Like, I might have to join the church. I might have to get involved. I might be expected to do something. It could be fearful. And then uh, the unbelieving. And then the category gets worse. The abominable. And the murderers. And whoremongers. And sorcerers. And idolaters. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I, I told you to mentally underscore that, which is the second death in verse 8. It's also in verse 14 of chapter 20, uh, the second death. As Brother Bogman and I were out uh, doing some door uh, knocking, soul winning yesterday in, in Lewisburg, we were uh, addressing this truth of the second death again and um, as we were departing the individual had already stated their unbelief Just don't believe God, don't believe the Bible don't believe, don't believe and um, we were departing and he said what is this wages of sin is death now we were already exiting and he said, and so he brought it up. So, I mean, okay. There you go. <laughs> Here, this is what the Bible says. And um, 
there, there's, there's twofold truth. A lot of Bible truths are twofold truth because God gives you something physical to bring to mind and heart something very spiritual. A, A.K. the parables. Well, in, in biblical truth, the wages of sin is death. In the day that thou eatest of this, thou shalt surely die. Did they die that day? You say, oh, they didn't die that day. No, they died later, but they died spiritually that day. That's right. And then they died physically. They would not have died. So there is a truth to that, that if you are a visual person, if you're hands-on, visual, Thomas, I have to see it. When you go to the graveyards, you're, you're not going to deny the fact that you died. There is physical death. The graveyards are full of that. Well, yeah. That's because you can see it. It, it, it touches your life. You, you handle that. So the ways of sin is death. Death in the Bible is separation. Separation from the body and soul and spirit. Separation from God for all of eternity is what he's talking about in verse 14 of chapter 20 and in verse 8 of chapter 21. Uh, the second death is that which you and I, we would look at that and say, okay, what does that mean? It means this individual has been overcome by the world, the flesh, and the devil, has never accepted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and they will physically die. They may reach it to be 100 years old or 110, I don't know what the current record is in our kind of time frame, but they may live a long life, but nothing in regards to eternity. Nothing. It's a vapor. But without Christ, they die the second death. The second death is a perpetual, perpetual death, a perpetual separation, a perpetual a torment and torture. And so then you can accept that and believe that or be like the individual yesterday that said, you're just trying to strike fear in me. Where 30 minutes before that, he said, there's nothing that makes me fearful. Yeah, why would you and be I'm, afraid not afraid, I'm not afraid of that. I said, no, hold up. We're not making you afraid. It's what the Bible says. You brought it up. And so uh, it, it was that type of preaching that got me saved at an early age. I, I'm fearful of hell, torment, you know, so forth. I, I was the youngest of six kids. I've been tormented all my life. <laughs> I, I'm not going to die and go to hell and be tormented for eternity in flame, pain, and torment. And that's the second death. Who were those that were overcome? They did not put their faith and trust in Jesus. That's right. You know, me and Jesus got it all worked out type of deal. No, Jesus did. And there, there is no works involved, nothing like that. And I'm not making light of that. That's why we go and tell people about Jesus, is to keep them out of hell. We go out and tell people about Jesus because the Bible says so. We go out and tell people about Jesus because uh, they can make a choice, and, and to make a choice for heaven, escape hell, and, and so forth. But uh, it, it's a dangerous thing. Now, uh, you notice this in verse 9. There is a vision of the perfected church, uh, the bride of Christ. There is a sense and there is a truth in, in the word of God that says that you and I have been perfected. You, ha you and I have been perfected. And when you and I have been perfected, it means when you got saved, and I'm talking about you really got saved. And I'm not talk, talking about sinless perfection at all. You can't do it. And uh, the holiness groups and so forth that, that preach that you can live above sin, that, that's not a Bible truth. Now, you ought to sin less, but you won't be sinless until you get your redeemed body, until Jesus comes back because you live in a body of flesh. But you ought to sin less. Where's the power to sin less? The indwelling Holy Spirit of God and relying on the Holy Spirit of God and making a choice. 
to be under the leadership of the, of the Holy Spirit of God. You get Bible, God talking to you. You get prayer, you talking to God. And you get a church. And so you need those support systems. And you kick the leg out of each of those support systems. And you're going to fall flat on your face. And you will be belly up in sin before you know it. Out of the word, will, and way of God. But anyway, the Bible says in verse 9, and there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And so this is a vision of the perfected church, the bride of Christ. And there are a, a lot of thoughts, there are a lot of uh, teachings on uh, the church and, and the bride of Christ. And so, uh, just very quickly, in Ephesians chapter 5, there is a, a physical illustration and picture for you and I to understand the, the heart and mind of God, which can be a, a blessing on earth if uh, you, as an individual, choose right and choose God. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, in verse 22, it talks about the wives submitting themselves to the husbands as unto the Lord. Uh, unto the Lord. And so it's husband and wife relationship as a married couple. One husband and one wife. Wife in submission to the husband as unto the Lord. It's simply dealing with position. And then husbands loving their wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Sanctify means set apart and cleanse is to keep pure. Now we have mentioned this uh, often that... Uh, if you get married, then you're set apart for each other. Now, that, that's obvious. If you get married, then you are deciding we are set apart for each other. It's not bringing others into that relationship. You've already made that decision. And if you can't make that decision, then you don't get married yet. And you allow the Lord's leading and cleansing or keeping it pure. You keep pure, uh, he keeps pure, she keeps pure. You belong to each other in the Lord and it will be done through the water of the word, not the television set. The television set is going to tell you that you need everything else but him and her and you deserve better than him, her, and uh, all these other things so will make you happy. And Hollywood is not for uh, you to be watching on uh, how to get a wife or a husband. It's through the Word of God. Amen. And God has got this worked out for you if you'll do it His way. Now watch this, that He might present it, what? The church, which is the bride, to Himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so this is a vision of the perfected uh, church or the bride of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, it speaks about the fact of uh, you have been uh, spoused. 2 Corinthians 11, 2, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, this all lends itself to the fact that a husband and a wife in marriage, as they enter into marriage, little did you know that is actually a picture of Christ in his church. That's why only 50% of them make it. Because the devil's out to get it. And that's why they redefined it and allowed it to open to anything. But the Bible says that's a picture of Christ in his church. And uh, then you and I, as a child of God, in how we stay pure for God, 
it is that same kind of picture that while Christ is away and the plans have been made and the marriage of the supper of the Lamb is being prepared and I've gone to prepare a place for you and all those types of things, if you would look at a, a Jewish wedding, it centers around that, that the man would go to prepare a place. When the place was prepared, the father says, it's ready, go get the bride, all those things. And it's picturesque of that. The father says, go, the son is anxious to get the bride, and the son gets the bride and goes back and says, uh, father, here's my bride. Praise God. It's like you're bringing somebody home for family approval, those types of things. And uh, if there's no bringing home to family approval, uh, there's a question mark. And it's you keeping yourself pure. And it's you keeping yourself pure for the Lord Jesus when he comes back because he's jealous. This is God the Son presenting his bride, the church, this is what I died for. This is the fruit that I've gained from that. It's redemption through Christ, but it is also the responsibility of the bride. And the church is a picture of the bride. And uh, you and I uh, make up uh, the bride of Christ in that sense. And so it is the child of God uh, staying pure for Jesus and not being led astray and there is this announcement from one of the angels in verse 9 like here comes the bride it's the triumph there is a heavenly abode you're going to see a new city here it's sparkling it's glorious it's grand and there's walls that represent security and there's jewels and so there's the vision of the perfected bride of Christ in uh, verse 9. Now notice verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. And had a wall great and high and had twelve gates and at the gates twelve angels and the names written there on which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And so 12 uh, in, uh, in the Bible is God's perfect number of, of governing rule. And seven is the number of perfection. You remember the book of Revelation is in sevens. 12 is perfect governing rule. And he says that uh, there are these 12 gates. The wall is very high, speaks of protection and 12 gates. There's 12 angels, and then there are the names of the 12 tribes. You see, God's not done with Israel. It has to do with those 12 tribes all the way back in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, God is symmetrical and perfect. And uh, we're not. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. See, there's the church represented, the 12 apostles. And Judas fell by way of his transgression. The Bible says he went to his own place. They had a vote because the church had already been started, and Matthias <coughs> was voted in, Acts chapter 1, verse 25. The Lord Jesus started his church before the day of Pentecost. It was energized by the Holy Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost. They already had a treasure. He was bad. He was a demon. He went to hell. They had a vote. They had the Lord's Supper. All those things were involved before the day of Pentecost. It was energized by the Holy Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost. But this speaks to the fact that the middle gate, the wall has been torn down, and uh, we're going to all be there. Twelve tribes of Israel are represented there, the chosen uh, people of God. And then uh, the chosen of the Lord Jesus, as far as Christianity goes, the twelve apostles of the Lamb, they're all represented there. The church is there. And uh, of chosen and elect, you know my position. I'm not Calvinist uh, at all. I'm not Armenian at all. And uh, you 
you say, well, what do you do with the fact that the Bible says God chose you? Uh, God chose the way that you get saved. He chose Jesus to be the one that died on the cross. And uh, Jesus willingly submitted to the uh, God the Father and went through with that. The call of God goes out. So God chooses you to salvation by grace through faith. And when I heard that, I chose God. So I, he, he chooses me. I choose him. Amen. Amen. And the Bible says that uh, God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And they all should, and they all could. They, not, they, not, uh, they won't all get saved. They all could get saved. There was enough shed blood for everybody to get saved. You say, do you believe that God chooses some to get saved and some to go to hell? I don't believe that for a minute. And so you can take all your verses and put them over here and say, this is why I'm a Calvinist. You can take all your verses and put them over here and say, this is why I believe you can lose your salvation. And then uh, somewhere in the middle of a lot of dual truth, you'll find the Bible truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. And if you choose to believe that by grace through faith, you can be saved. Uh, amen. And so there's the new Jerusalem. Jerusalem is city of peace. And you have the 12 gates. They're guarded by 12 angels. Nothing's uh, getting in that shouldn't be in. By the grace of God, you're saved. You're not getting out either. You don't want out. Amen. And then uh, the Bible speaks about this. Verse 14 had 12 foundations. They are the apostles. Disciples. There are no more apostles. There's no, no more apostolic succession. And so uh, though those kinds of sign gifts were temporary and they are gone. When did they leave, preacher? When you got the completed word of God. When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And you have the word of God. If you have to have something more fantastic and more visual, then it's not faith. And faith is how you get saved. Faith is how you live. Faith to believe the Bible. And so these 12 apostles and uh, there's the foundations. And praise God for these foundations. I, I hadn't, I, somebody kept mentioning the thing down in Florida and I, I hadn't seen that at, at all. And then I pulled it up on Google. It directed me to YouTube and there was a security camera down by this building 12-story building that part of it just simply collapsed you know when it collapsed like 1 30 in the morning and so you go to bed and uh, at 1 30 in the morning 12-story building collapses now why did it collapse I, I don't know but uh, something gave way on the foundation is what I would suspect something it will never give way but the foundation of Christ foundation of God standeth sure the Bible says he knoweth uh, those that are his and this new city this new Jerusalem has 12 foundations and praise God these foundations are different they're actually visible they deal with the 12 apostles of the Lamb or the, the Christian church he talked with me verse 15 had a golden reed to measure the city the gates thereof and the wall thereof the city lieth four square you see God is perfect the length is as large as the breadth. He measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and breadth and height of it are equal. When you look at that and study some of the Old Testament tabernacle and Holy of Holies, you'll see uh, some of those comparisons. And I'm not going to deal with that right now, but uh, God is symmetrical and perfect. And uh, we can't do it with a laser. I mean, I can't, but uh, God can. He measured the wall. 140 and four cubics, according to the measure of a man. That's probably 18 inches, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper. city was pure gold, like clear glass. So it's perfect, it's beautiful, it's glorious. And when you're in awe of a city nowadays, it's absolutely nothing in comparison to this. But uh, with, with all of the language that we have here, it, it only strikes the mental capacity to a small degree. and. Uh, can't comprehend except for the language that he has here. The foundations of the wall of the city are garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth 
sardinox, the sixth sardius, seventh crystallite, eighth beryl, ninth topaz, the tenth crisporus, eleventh uh, adjacinth, the, the twelfth and amethyst. If you would look at, at those, you would notice that it deals with uh, some of the jewels that are in the breastplate of, of the priest uh, of Israel. And then uh, without taking time to go there, Malachi 3.17 the close of the Old Testament, he says, when he makes up these jewels. And that's what you are to the Lord Jesus when he makes up these jewels. And it'll be perfect. And uh, there'll be, you'll, you'll be in your glorified body, you'll be perfect, but you'll also be you. You know, every person's different. With the, I, I think there's not quite seven billion with a B people on planet Earth, but uh, they're everyone different. Like maybe uh, iris, eye, or fingerprints, and those types of things. When the Lord makes up His His jewels, verse twenty one, twelve gates were twelve pearls. Speaks of suffering. You know the pearl of great price. And Christ suffered to to get His pearl or the Lord Jesus Christ suffered to get his church and there is a suffering the street of the city was pure gold as transparent glass I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it temples throughout the word of God speaks of God meeting with his people so you had the temporary tabernacle you had Solomon's temple and uh, then you had Zerubbabel's temple it was renovated by Herod to appease the Jews and that one was wiped out. It's gone. They don't have a temple now, but the church has a temple, and it's you. And God indwells you through the Holy Spirit of God. And um, at this point, there'll be no uh, temple. There's going to be a temple in uh, the tribulation time frame because the book of Daniel says the Antichrist will go set himself up in the temple uh, as God. And then there'll be a millennial temple in the thousand-year reign. And it'll be... Uh, more like what we do with the Lord's Supper and remembrance and so forth. But uh, the temple is not here because God is there with his people. Verse 23, the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut up. Uh, at all day, uh, all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory of the honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's a book of life. And so it speaks about the foundations, and the foundations, of course, are, are very uh, important. The Bible says of Christ in Isaiah chapter 28, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. That's Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. That was 700 years before the Lord Jesus Christ came. God said, I'm going to, to lay in Zion, or the city of Jerusalem, this tried stone. And he's speaking about Christ. He is the foundation. And then on the foundation, the Bible speaks about the Christian. speaks about you in 2 Timothy 2.19. The Bible says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. This is speaking about the Christian. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Speaking about the foundation of the Christian. And then last, in Ephesians 2.20, the Bible speaks about the foundation of the church. The Bible says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's Ephesians 2.20. That's where we say the church is like unto a building. The church is analogous to the bride of Christ, it is analogous to the body of Christ. It is analogous to the building of Christ. This city that he's speaking of is 1,500 miles cubed. 1,500 miles in a cube. 
That means there's enough for everybody. Every saved person. In verse 22, the Bible says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And so he's speaking again about the equality of God the Father and God the Son. The equality of them. They're in communion with saved man. In verse 27, the Bible uh, speaks to us the fact that there is no more curse, no sin. There's, there's no presence of sin in heaven. And man dwells there in the eternal state. This is in heaven, all by the grace of God. And so in chapter 21, as we uh, end this chapter this morning, you've just seen the vision of the perfected church or the bride of Christ. When a person gets saved, they're placed into the family of God. The Holy Spirit of God moves in and seals them to the day of redemption. An individual that says, well, I believe in the universal church then that is an individual that believes in the universal mystical body of Christ. But in believing of that, there's the danger of taking away from the local church. And within the Bible, you see the local church. And God uses his local church to do his work therein. I believe that everybody uh, ought to get saved. And it's our prayer as a church that the people that we deal with and that we come into contact with, they would get saved. That'll get them into heaven. Then I believe from the Bible that saved people ought to get scripturally baptized. And then I believe from the Bible that saved and scripturally baptized people ought to get plugged into a local church to get serving. And I believe that uh, every local church, I understand, that's a true New Testament church, has personality like people have personality. Sometimes uh, somebody may say that church is very welcoming. They, they may say they're very uh, friendly over there and very loving and so forth. They may say different things about the local church. And they, they have personality. I understand that. But every saved, born-again child of God ought to be in a church, a biblical church. And of all the churches that are there, they're not all true churches. But every saved person ought to be a part of a biblical, scriptural church where they fit in. If you go out and talk to people, you generally talk to people like this in two categories. They're either saved or they're not saved. And if you take that saved group and come on down the line some, they either go to church or they don't go to church. You go down a little further, uh, they may go to church now and then, or they may be regular in church. Or... Uh, it has to be this flavor, this type. I, I like this one for the music. I like this one for the atmosphere. I like this one for the people. I like this one. Uh, sometimes it's for the preaching and teaching. Typically it's for the other things. They have a good program for the kids. Or there are a, a lot of my age group. I enjoy the music program, those types of things. And, and you go down through there. It's very interesting to talk to people about that. And then some of them are saved, say they're saved, born again, child of God, and they just, they don't go to church. And so it, it's something to think about as you study the book of Revelation. There was the vision of the perfected church, and, and God loves you, God saves you, and God is jealous over you with a godly jealousy. That you and I would stay pure for him, washing of the water of word, stay on track, all by the grace of God, and he'll work everything out. And so praise God for that. There are those that overcome, the overcomers, and then this city 
that God is preparing for you and I. And it will blow your mind when you study it, what God has in store for those that love him. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the Sunday school hour, the study of the word of God, and for all those that came out, praying, dear Lord, for the service that follows, that you'll meet with us, speak to our hearts through your word, by your spirit. Give us exactly what we need and uh, strengthen us, dear Lord, for the day that lies ahead. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.